ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome from all of us in the Macedonian Society of Great Britain and the Hellenic Centre who is hosting our event here tonight. I'm Panos Dafas, the President of the Macedonian Society of Great Britain, a society that was founded in London in 1989 by members of the Greek community in London. We are a registered society in the UK and a member of society of the Hellenic Centre. As you probably know, the primary aim of the society is the promotion of the Hellenic culture, heritage and history uh, of Macedonia, but Greece in general. Our main source of funding is donations from the public, but also from various foundations. We are truly privileged that uh, uh, we have the support of the AG Leventis Foundation for several years now who is also our main sponsor tonight. If you are interested in joining us, uh, you can just you know, visit our website, macedonia.org.uk, under Join Us, or come and talk to us, introduce yourself, and uh, we can talk about how and uh, how we can help these people uh, uh, not because. Today's event is about the Hellenic influence of, in the world of opera. This event coincides almost to the date with the birth of one of the greatest sopranos of all time, Maria, Maria Callas. Uh, nearly, or exactly, I would say, 100 years ago, who I'm sure many of us remember and continue to listen. However, for tonight's event, we have invited three exceptionally talented musicians from Greece who are going to perform a number of opera pieces revealing its Hellenist, Hellenistic influences. The event has two parts, uh, with a two-minute uh, break, intermission, and uh, we, we have a wine reception at the back of the hall. Uh, in the second part, the artists will, will perform arias and duets from operata, operatas written in the Greek language. So without further ado, Please welcome Emmanuel Papasipakis, Chrysanthi Berundaki, and Dimitris Sigalos. The stage is yours. See? 
Sardis, and it's a great pleasure to be here. My first time actually here at the Hellenic Center in London. And I'd just like to say, I will say a few things along the way about programming. My little swallow has flown away. Don't forget me and come back in the springtime. Those are the words of this very famous and popular Italian song we just heard, sung by many famous opera singers. In the late 1500s, in Renaissance Italy, and the cultural capital of Renaissance Italy was Florence, there developed a group of artists, poets, and musicians. And as we all know, during the Italian Renaissance, there was a great interest in the classical era, Greek and Roman. And this group, which called itself the Florentine Camerata, made it its project and an aim to recreate ancient Greek drama. And of course, we knew and know that Greek drama was at least in good part sung. There was a chorus and there were actors. We don't know exactly what the music sounded like, but we do know that much of it was sung and with instruments along. So they decided to create this form, which we call now opera. The, of course, they used the music that they knew, the music of their area and their country and the wider Mediterranean area. And in 1604 or 1605, the very first opera appeared in one of the palaces. It's called Daphne by a composer named Jacobo Berry. A little bit later, he came out with the second opera called Every Week. Here it is. And so we have the art form of opera, which itself, from the very start, was formed under the influence of Hellenistic Greece and with the direct uh, aim of recreating ancient Greek drama. And for many years, even in our time, but uh, at least for the first two centuries or so after that, many operas, in fact most of them, had themes which were directly related to ancient Greek myth, ancient Greek true historical figures, and also Roman historical figures and myths. So, our program today has some excerpts from some of these operas with direct Greek references, but also I wanted to start out by saying that the basis of all of opera, and that includes everything else that's on this program, because we have some things that are from light opera, like operetta, and we have some Italian songs by opera composers. Uh, all of it is derived from this original aim of Renaissance Florence to recreate Greek drama. So, we continue with the program. We have two selections now from a little bit later than the origin of opera. The first one is by Alessandro Scarlatti, as you see on your program. He was, came around a hundred years later from the Florentine days. This particular opera that this comes from is an early opera. He was the main opera composer of his time. 
It takes place somewhere in North Africa. Uh, and the text says that I have reached the Ganges River and the sun is rising and illuminating everything wonderfully. Now, of course, we don't know exactly who is saying this, but in those days, everybody knew that the person who went to the Ganges first, at least from Europe, was who else but Alexander the Great. So the reference would have been very clear to everybody at that time what it was referring to and who. The next piece that we have is from another later, also great opera composer, buried in, here in London at Westminster Abbey, dear George Frederick Handel. This second selection is from his opera, Julius Caesar, also in its full title, Julius Caesar in Egypt. This opera is about Caesar's first trip to Egypt, where he meets, guess who? Cleopatra. And, of course, Cleopatra, she was the last ruler of Egypt. She was the last of the Ptolemies, which was the dynasty which had run Egypt for 300 years. They were Macedonians. When Alexander the Great died, his empire got divided among his various generals, and Ptolemy was the one that took Egypt, and his family ruled until Julius Caesar's time. And uh, this aria that we're going to hear from Visanti is their first meeting in the opera, where Cleopatra appears in a play, <coughs> pretending or playing to be the goddess of the Aphrodite, Venus. And of course, Julius Caesar is totally smitten. And there starts the story of Caesar and Cleopatra. So we have two Baroque arias down the Ganges River and Cleopatra from Handel's Julius Caesar.
from a much later period and from some of the most popular operas in the world. First, we have the duet from La Traviata of Verdi, Parigi Ocana. As you may know, this story was taken from a novel by Alexandre Dumas, Jr., a French writer, The Lady of the Camellias. It's the story of Violetta, who works, lives as a courtesan in 19th century Paris, falls in love with a young man, falls in love with her. They get separated, and she is in this scene, in the last act, uh, literally on her deathbed. She has tuberculosis, which at that time was a very deadly disease. And she is just before the end reunited with her beloved Alfredo. They say, we're going to leave Paris. We're going to have a nice life. Your health is going to improve. It's a nostalgic and happy moment, but of course, that's not the way the story turns out. Then we have an aria, one of the most popular arias in opera from Puccini's opera, Madame Butterfly, Un Bel B, in which the geisha girl, Cho Cho San, Madame Butterfly, is awaiting the return with confidence of the American officer who had come there, fallen in love with her, married her, in fact, and then left. Again, another opera with a very sad ending, but this is her most famous aria, Unpen. And finally, the third one from Pagliacci, the very well-known and popular Vesti La Giupa, Canio, the protagonist, who is the head of a troop of performing actors, is discovering that his wife is unfaithful to him. And he is saying, I have to dress up like a clown and act funny when I feel so horrible. Best So we have these three selections coming out now. Traviata, Madame Butterfly, and Pagliacci. Bye, I do
We end our first half of the program with this very famous duet. It is from one of the last operas and greatest operas of one of the greatest of all opera composers, Verdi, Othello, based, of course, as an adaptation of Shakespeare's play, Othello. We are in the first act. Othello, of course, is the military commander of Cyprus, at that time under Venetian rule. He was in the employ of the Republic of Venice as the military commander in Cyprus. The opera opens with a fierce storm, and Othello is at sea with the Navy, fighting off the invading Turks. And they win. And they come back victorious to the cheers of all the Cypriots that are watching this whole battle on land, from the land. And uh, as the day goes on and night falls, the weather comes down, and Othello comes home to his beloved wife, this day one up. And they reminisce about how they first met, about how they first fell in love, and they retire into the night in full, full happiness and of a beloved husband and wife. Unfortunately, for those who know the story, Othello is, is deceived by his second of command into believing that his wife is unfaithful and there's tragic consequences for her. But here we are not yet there. This is the very beautiful love duet that ends the first act of Vanity's Hotel. Oh, oh, oh. 
words right here at the start about our second half of this program, and then we're just going to run it through with no more commentary from me. Uh, in the late 1800s, around the turn of the century, the last two decades or so, a group of composers, which in Greek are called the Ektanisi, that is, from the Ionian Islands, Corfu, most of all, but also Zakynthos and Kepalonia. These islands really did not undergo a Turkish occupation. Rather, they remained under Italian and chiefly Venetian control, while all the rest of Greece was under Turkish occupation. So these islands had a very, a culture very influenced by Italy. They loved opera, and some of them wrote some operas. Uh, and this was a kind of beginning of a Greek classical music school. Um, after all those years, where Greece was remote, in a way, from the rest of Europe. Um, one of these composers, Spiros uh, Samaras, who we'll be hearing a lovely lullaby from Dimitris further down in the second half of the program, wrote quite a few operas that had, in Italian, that had quite a bit of success in Italy. In fact, it is said that Leo Cavallo, the composer of Pagliacci and the Matina, we heard from the first half, actually stole music from him and put it in his own opera, Pagliacci, at the beginning of the Besti La Juba that we had heard. Uh, Samanas's operas, many of them have been lost. Uh, many of them during World War II, actually, with the bombings and the destruction of libraries in many Italian cities. A few Greek composers have written operas other than Samaras. However, it seems that the most lasting contribution to Greek lyrical classical singing and opera-like derivative of opera works is the Greek operetta. Most of them were composed in the first few decades of the 20th century Bakristikos, the godson, Apachides of Athenon, and a few others have been still and are still the most popular works of this type in Greece. Uh, lovely melodies, lovely choruses, fun stories. Uh, they're still performed all over Greece. So we decided, especially since we're in a holiday season that we would devote the second half to this Greek repertoire of light opera, in this case, and they're very joyous pieces that we all love, and they're performed in Greece all the time, so I hope you enjoy this second half of our program.
Oh.